does. Now, how will this sound differently from this? You takers? It shouldn't. It's basically. It's exactly the same. Yeah. All it does is instead of going up to 88.2 in 2,000 mm -hmm. milliseconds, it goes to 100,000 and more. So it just plays off play the end of the table, which does nothing. Right. <clears throat> well, playing off the end of the table simply sticks at the last point. Uh, okay. So again, if this was... This is your brain on drugs. Then this is the same thing. This is your brain on drugs. Okay. Wait, what is, why doesn't it play like the little noise up to the two seconds? Because you stopped it at two seconds? Uh, there is noise there, but if you wanted to hear that, I would have to turn the volume way up. So this noise uh, is being played. Uh, yeah, whatever, whatever is there. In fact, if we listen to it, it's not. But oh, actually, why don't we do this? How how you would hear that and just that is we could go to. Let's see, this is you started starting at zero. You started eighty-eight. Yeah, well, I won't start there, but I'll start around here, so maybe that's uh, 80,000 or something like that. So let's go, uh, where am I going to do this? Here, 80,000, and then I'll just add something. And I'll say 2,000. So here, oh, no, wait, two, two, six, eight. Sorry, okay, let me explain this now that I've done it. So now what I'm going to do, I, I believe this to be 88,000 right here, because I set the table to be 88,200 samples long. So this might be about 80,000, maybe plus or minus. And now what I have to do is start there and go to another point, which is 200,000 more, and to go there in this amount of time, which is the amount of time I should, oh, I don't have that box anymore, but this is the amount of time it should take to go to, oh, it's 100,000. Sorry, here. Go from a point most of the way through the table, 100,000 samples further, and do it in the amount of time that's correct for 100,000. So instead of hearing this, this is your brain on drugs. Hear this. And now, if you want to know what's in there really, then I'll take the risk of turning the audio up, and you'll hear the room's reverberation and things like that, maybe. Yeah, it's a little... I don't know what that is. It might be the room ringing, or it might be me clicking on something right after I said it, or something else. No. Why did you choose that amount of time, 2268? What's the, as opposed to just like two seconds? Or... Oh, right. So. That was, yeah, that happened last time. I computed how much time 100,000 samples lasts. Oh. And I did it using a Oh, right, right, right. right, That's this thing. So you just try to do that in real time? I didn't want to actually recompute it, so I just used the value I happened to know. But the value I happened to know was um, if I want to have 100,000 samples, and I'm running at 44 kilohertz, 0.1. That's the number of seconds that amount of that number of samples lasts. So if you don't put that number in, then it won't be at the exact same time like you recorded it. Like that's real right. time, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. That's or real time. That's to say that's for no transposition. And this isn't a good example. This is. This is your brain on drugs. So if I change this to something else, like. But what if you didn't put it up here? If you didn't put a number at all, would then it would go to zero, and then it would jump to 100,000 and stay there. Oh, you hear nothing. Okay. Yeah. So how would you start it right where the recording actually starts and make it accurate? Good question. How would you find the place at the beginning of the table in order to be able to start right there? There are a bunch of ways you could do that. Um, the way I would do it, if it were me, is I would do the following. Oh, this will take, I have to add a concept here, but I'll do it. Because I was wondering when I was going to be able to add this concept. So how about instead of, um, sorry, how am I going to really do this? I'm 
I'm not going to add any concepts at all. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make a little player. Okay. So now I need some room. I'm going to make a little player that plays little tiny segments of the table. The concept, by the way, that I want to add is, is using message boxes to make variable messages, like using dollar signs, but I haven't hit a place where I need that yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make one of these, except I'm going to make it be variable. Right? Let's see, I'm going to need some room. I can still reuse all that, and this, I'm going to stick over here so that I have room up here. Down, make the window bigger. It's going to be a little bit of work. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a message, or sorry, a number box, and I'm going to arrange for the table to play, starting at the number box, a few samples. All right? So to do that, what we're going to want is to generate something like this number, comma, and then another number in a certain <coughs> amount of time, except that the numbers are going to be variable. So for instance, uh, the numbers might be, let's start at 10,000, and then let's go to ten, uh, 10, uh, another thousand, and let's take 100 milliseconds. So these two, if I did them in sequence, would go click, and then okay, so what this is nice and metallic. That's me doing a consonant, probably, and it's at the wrong speed, because I haven't been careful about speed here. Okay. Now, how would I do that except make the 10,000 variable? Well, it's not so hard. All we have to do is we have to use the wonderful trigger object to generate two messages. One of the messages will go straight through. The other one, we're going to add 100 to it, and then pack it in order to make a message with it and 100. So that's going to be like this. So this one is, instead of doing this, we're just going to run this straight in. And this one is going to be a packed message using the pack object. And what we're going to pack is going to start with 0 and 100, like this, except we're going to replace the value of 0 with something. And the value that we're going to replace is going to be whatever this thing is plus 1,000. And now we have to send a message in here and there, and we should do it in the right order. So we should use the trigger object. Trigger, okay, th these are all objects you've seen, although you haven't seen them done this way, so I'm doing a sort of review. So first off, we're going to send the value as a floating point number to the line, and then Immediately after, we we're going to send a value which is a thousand more. But it's going to be in a packed message with a hundred. And now if I say ten thousand, I get my message back, or I get my sound back. But now I can do it. Oh, that's okay, this isn't moving very much. So let's, um, let's uh, do some labor saving and multiply it by a hundred. Now, whoa, these values are too big. So now what we're doing is we're scratching through the sample. You know what, this is at such a horrible pitch you can't even tell what's happening, or I can't. So I'm going to say, do this in about a fifth the time that I said before. And now it's too high. Right, which we're going to have to work to But notice now I can say, here's the very beginning. This is your question now. Here's the very beginning of it. If I want to know exactly what the beginning was, 
maybe I should subtract this thousand from here, but it's close enough. And I don't know of a better way actually of finding the beginning of a, well, I don't know a better simple way of finding the beginning of a sound than just looking for it all, audibly like that. Question? Can you go over, sorry, trigger both over one more time? Yeah, good idea. Okay, so trigger, I've introduced, and I think the last time it was trigger with two bangs as a way of, of uh, making two message boxes be in the correct order. And now I'm using a slight twist on the trigger object, which is that it will take whatever message you put in and output that message from right to left, in right to left order, let's see, it looks like this to you. And it will put out variously floating point numbers or bangs, which are messages that don't have any data, or lists, in case your message has more than one number in it. And in, so in this case, what it's doing is it's interpreting this as a floating point number each time, which is appropriate. And it's first putting the number 2700, 2700 out here, and then it's putting it out here so that it can get 100 added to it and it get packed with the value of 40. So that, if I want to see what's happening to the line with a print object, no tilde needed, just the regular old message print, I can do this. Now the print is hooked up exactly the same as the line object is, which is down here, right? Okay. What does the number 40 represent in the pack? 40 is an, is an amount of time. Right. So what I'm sending the line is these two messages. 2,700, that's, uh, that's came from this 27 when I multiplied it by 100. And then the other message is going to be a target value and a time. The target value is computed by adding 1,000 to whatever the start time was, and the time I, I just gave is 40. And now, of course, 40 milliseconds isn't the right amount of time for 1,000 samples to last. But I just remembered that we went through the trouble of finding out that 100,000 samples is 2,268 milliseconds. So really here, for 1,000, we should use 100th of that, which is 22.6. It's not going to be exactly right for technical reasons. And now I've got a little scratcher. Why exactly do you want to pack those? I'm not getting that. Oh, why do I want to pack these? So that the message itself can have two values in it. Because uh, line tilde wants to get a message which is target and amount of time in a single message. So that's what you're packing <coughs> in, except for that to show that in the print. So just, right. Uh, so that automatically replaces the zero? Yes, so the zero initialized this input, but it got replaced, or is getting replaced every time I put in a number. In fact, I could replace this by sending numbers in here, too. Could you hypothetically, no, no, not hypothetically, but send the trigger also to the right input of the pack, and so whatever you're sending to that zero, you're also sending to the right? So, like, you know how you're getting, like, 4,000, I mean, 40,200? Plus, uh, you mean make a make a thing that has forty four that has this number twice. Yeah, you could do that, but you could also but you could do it wrong like this. Uh, this won't sound good. But I'll do this just for the sake of the argument. And I do that, and then I'll put a number in here, and I get the correct value and whatever the previous correct value was. So now we have one of these situations where. If you put a message in here, that generates output, and then if you put a message in there, it updates the inlet, but you want to update the inlet first so that that value can be there when the outlet comes. I forget about that. That's the Right. And to do that, you need another trigger object. Oh. Yeah. So if you put another parameter in there as well, will that create another inlet as well that you can control that to? Yeah, and I think line tilde doesn't care about that. Uh, I'll give it another value. Oh, let's not do this anymore. <laughs> so right now it's getting, it's making messages with three values. The, the thing about that is that 
there aren't very many objects running on PD that can meaningfully deal with three numbers at a time. They're all designed to be as elemental or as, as um, elementary as they possibly can, as atomic as they can be. So you don't you, frequently when you're well in general when you're just using objects and formatting messages for them, pack with two numbers is all you're going to need. However, when you make instruments yourself that might have 100 parameters in them to describe a voice, you might find yourself packing all those 100 parameters into a big Mondo message. So eventually it's going to be interesting to be able to use pack with large numbers, or at least medium-sized numbers of parameters in it. If that's the case, would you use like a PD window, that hidden window, you do that, and then just have those with you? Would, yeah, that's by that enough. point you would, you would be hot, keeping everything under the hood, yeah, in a big way. And we'll get there, but not maybe not even the first quarter of this. Other questions? Everybody's happy with this. I can't believe you actually all understand what's going on. Of course not. I wouldn't say all. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, all right, so my plans for the rest of the day are to make this more complicated. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> because, of course, <laughs> because it would be useful to, do, to be able to do things like actually control the, the transposition. Uh, so samplers, you know, when you buy a sampler, you, you sample something and then you hit C and you hear the original thing, so you hit G and you want to hear it transposed to fit, and that sort of thing. So I want to talk about transposition and how to deal with it. And the other thing, which is perhaps even more fundamentally important, is how to keep it from making all those clicks. And there are several ways of doing that. I want to show you two of them. So what I think I should do is start with the transposition business, and it sounds will still be kind of revolting, but you'll at least see how it's possible to transpose stuff. And then after that, I'll start starting on trying to work on the clicks. All right, so transposition stuff. Now, for transposition, uh, it's not so easy necessarily to hear how much this is being transposed by, because you might not know what the original, does everyone know what transposition is? That's a musical term. Okay. That means, that means the change in pitch that you get when you read out of the sampler compared to what you put into it. At least that's what it means in sampler land. Okay, so what I'm going to do is get rid of this because we're not going to get here so fast. But I'm going to click out in a future window. Whoa. What kind of sign do we have here? Okay, so I'm going to save this. Not yet. We'll come back to, okay, what this is that, that we will come back to is using a phaser object to drive a sampler, which you in fact saw for the first time on Tuesday, but, uh, but I haven't shown you, for instance, how to do things like affect the transposition in, in this way of doing sampling. So we've seen two ways of, of operating samplers in the same way as we've seen two ways of reading sequences back. One of which is this way, which is the signal, signaling way, which is generated dimension. Well, which if you look all the way up to the top of the network, you'll typically see a phaser tilde object. The other way of doing it is to just use messages, in which case you can do things in much more irregular ways, but there is sometimes more to think about when you're doing messages than just doing phasers. So this, which is maybe even conceptually simpler, I'm going to get rid of and go back to the more complicated thing. And meanwhile, let's see, I'll just set a good example by putting the high pass filter there. And this, yeah, we might need this later. Okay, so what we're going to do to start with is just listen to a nice sample. So this, so that's what's in this file. 
And now what I want to do is say, okay, that was a nice G, but I want to hear an A. All right? Question, how do you get from G to A? Well, you transpose. Okay, how do you transpose? Okay, choice. You could. Okay, so we know basically how to transpose. We know that rather than do this, we should do it in approximately 18, 12% less than this. It's going to be 1850-ish. So instead, it's easier to say, go to a place that I know is beyond the end of the table. In fact, when I'm doing this for myself, I usually make this in the millions so that it's beyond any table that I would be likely to use. And then compute the amount of time that you really should do that in, in milliseconds. All right. There are a couple of ways you could do that. I could either do this explicitly with logarithms, or I could do it the less brainy way, which is I could reach for MIDI to frequency and operate that way. So I'll do that because that's easier to think about. Or rather, I don't know, I find this easier to think about. Maybe you will too. So, here, so here's how you do this. You say, So MIDI to frequency is a thing which allows you to take a number which is a which is a frequency. Ah, one the box. Well, sorry. It's this is a this is a number in MIDI and it converts it into frequency. So for instance, if I feed it 60, I find the number of hertz in middle C. If I feed it 61. I will be, whoa, sorry, zero. I'll be 6% uh, faster and so on like that. Okay. And now I'm realizing I'm trying to be s as simple as possible, so I'm going to go back on my earlier promise to do this correctly in order to do it more simply in the following way. So what I'm going to do is say, okay, we're going to go to 100,000 and 2268 milliseconds, all right, except that my value of 100,000 is going to be different. I want to fix it so that when I say 60, it'll be 100,000, all right, but if I say 61, it'll be 60 more, and so on like that. Okay, how do I do that? Well, it's easy. I just change 261.6, whatever it is, to 100,000. To do that, it's rescaling. The simple minded way of doing it is just divide by what it was and multiply it by what you want it to be. This is the other number I use every day. It's the number of hertz in the middle C. And then I'm going to multiply by 100,000. And then I'm going to, why don't, uh, why don't I set a good example and use this network here? Oh, let's just say that. <coughs> Trigger. This trigger gives me a value which goes here, and then it gives me the. I'm going to stick this in here, and what I want it to do is I want it to say zero, and then I want it to say this value packed with the amount of uh, the amount of time, which is two two six eight. So lose all this, except I want the print object still. Let's see, what's a 
good. Okay, here I just want the bang. Don't need this anymore. Oh, so in fact it would be better if I put all this in one place. So when, the, when I get a bang, I want to go to the value 0, like this. That's the beginning of the table. And then afterward, I'm going to pack the amount of time, which will replace 0 with the wonderful amount of time, 2268. This is all well. And now, I have G. Specific, and then I'll try to answer I've lost, which is more general. <laughs> okay, so the specific question is, why would I put a bang out here and float out here? Um, okay, so this is a message box, which will put out zero no matter what goes in. So in fact, I could have put in a bang or a floating point number or a list of numbers or anything, and out would have come the message zero. Um, I put bang here as a matter of style because I didn't want to put float because it was just going it was just going to be ignored anyway. And so it was simpler to think of it just as being bang. So bang is just a message that doesn't have any numerical values associated with it. It's the equivalent of the keyword void in C. So what happens is whenever I say a number here sorry whenever I say a number here, stuff happens. Oh I should print this number out in C. Display this for you. So you enjoy it. Hey. So 60 again. Whoa. Sorry. And the width will be 7 because it might be a big number. Ta da. Ooh, truncation error. You won't hear that. Um, okay, so, alright, so stuff happens and this number comes out to 1000, which is the number of sam which is the number I want to put here. Oh yes, and right, I need my print object again. So let's do the print object. So now this print object is showing us exactly what's happening to the line tilde. Right, let's get rid of all this. We've got this in the previous patch. It's not doing anything for us now. Alright, so 61 here got or it got um, turned into 100,000. And then trigger says first, send a bang to here, which outputs the message zero, which causes line tilde to jump to zero, which causes tab read tilde to read from the first element of the array. Okay. Then this gets the number 100,000 because I asked for a floating point number, which is just a number. So this is now the message 100,002. Sorry about the two. And then we pack that with 2268, and so then what we see is the message, which is 100,000 and 2268. So this pair of messages got printed out, I think. So now it's going from 0 to 2268. It starts at 0 and then goes to 2268. Oh, I don't see anything. Oh, I don't. Maybe I connected the print after. Oh. So it gets two messages. It's zero and then 100,000 and 2268. Yeah. So basically this time we're transposing by instead of changing the amount of seconds it takes with the line object by changing the amount of samples. Right. Like that. And the reason I did that was because it made the math simpler, not because it made the math better. <laughs> yeah. Is there a sample to second kind of like M2F kind of thing? Well, that you just kind of bypass the map. No. No, there isn't. Um, yeah, there, basically there are no primitives that would make this any easier, although I could tell you how to make it a little bit more complicated. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you will. 
So now there are two things to understand, I guess. One is, uh, one is the, the bit that, one is this bit here, the stuff that's actually making the sound, which is to say sequencing two messages for the line tilde and making the sampler read. Okay. The other thing to understand is how on earth I'm computing this value. So this is the value that you have to stick here in order to get the right transposition. And now to answer your question a little bit better, uh, I want this value to, to be proportional to this value and not proportional to its inverse. And I didn't want to have to divide by something. I could, but it would be more work. Yeah? How did you get the 100,000 to again? OK, well, it got it for me. What I did was I, I said, I want 60 to, to go to 100,000. OK, so, so, this is, so now what you're asking is, what is the design of this collection of objects? There really are only three objects here that are doing stuff. There's the MIDI to frequency, and then there is a rescaling, which is these two objects. We divide by the number of hertz in the middle C, and then we multiply by 100,000. Okay. So what's happening here is, we know that these numbers coming out have the correct proportions so that we can do musical scales or musical intervals. Why? Because MTOF, if I, for instance, uh, add 12 to the value here, multiplies its result by 2. Right? So M to F is, is the thing which takes 12 steps and turns it into multiply by 2. Or if you like, it takes the keys of a piano and converts them to hertz. So that you move up 12 keys on the piano and it doubles the value. Right. Now that we have the ability to do that, just and that's just this object which does the math for us that does that. It's not so bad. It's, I can tell you the expression, but it's, it's just an exponentiation, except it's scaled correctly. Then what we what we say is, okay, I want those those proportions, that's to say I want. 72 to be twice what 60 is, I want 48 to be a half of what 60 is, and so on like that. But anyway, I want 60 to give me 100,000. So how do I do that? I just have to multiply by the number which is 100,000 over 261.62. Well, that's kind of, oh, that's the right word. I could do that. I could divide 100,000 by 261.62, but I found it more pedagogically <coughs> transparent hopefully, to use two objects so that I divide by 261.62 to get a transposition, and then multiply by this because I want a transposition of 1 to give you a value of 100,000. So in fact, I should have been showing you two numbers. First off, this number is the interval from 60. So if I give it 60, I get 1 there. So we divide by 261.626, that's just so that 60 gives us 1. And by the way, now we're in floating point land, we're going to represent this value exactly, it's irrational anyway. So um, instead we just, we get as close as we can in floating point land to it. And then having, so now 60 goes to 1, so 72 would go to 2, for instance. 84 would go to 4. Oops. 96 would go to 8, and so on like that. 48 goes to a half, and then harder values, so there was 60 again, which goes to 1. Go up a fifth, you go to 67, which is MIDI for G above middle C, and that turns into roughly 1 and a half, because 7 semitones is roughly a factor of multiple of 1 and a half to 1. But not exactly. <laughs> yeah. If you go too low, though, it's going to start uh, kind of flipping right because you don't have enough samples. Well, it'll just stop after two seconds, even if it doesn't get to the end of the sample. So if I say, yeah, do uh, 24. Do 30. Right? Stops after two seconds. Oh, it stops Stop, after. While you heard it, it was like. Do, 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 yeah. do, do, do. Right. This is now, what is that, three octaves below middle C? Mm. So I was 
droning along at 100 hertz, and you divide that by 80, you get about 12, which is an audible rate. Maybe that's 12 hertz-ish. Oh, and so that's one eighth the transposition down by a factor of eight, and an eighth of 100,000 is this number, which is the amount we go in the table, which only gets us to about here, somewhere in there. And it takes that 2.2 seconds to do it, but it originally had taken 100,000 samples. Oh, so it's not playing the whole clip, it's only playing a portion of the clip? Yeah. So you're not really transposing it. Transposing would be playing the whole thing, but in a different key or in a different frequency. Yeah, so it's transposing it, but then it's cutting the transposition off after two seconds. So if you would have a... Okay. And yeah, I could have done it the other way, which is I could have said, go to the end of the table and compute the amount of time that you do, but then I would have had to divide by this number, which would have been an extra trigger object, and I didn't want to make it any more complicated than it already is. Yeah? When you're multiplying by 100,000, what, what is that number representing? In amount of so that's the number of samples at, okay, if you were at unit transposition, that's to say if you were playing the original sound back, that is the number of samples that you would play in 2,268 milliseconds. So the value of 100,000 is in fact arbitrary. I chose that in some other context two days ago. <coughs> And now I'm just sticking with that value because I happen to know that 100,000 samples at 44 kilohertz corresponds to this number of milliseconds. Um, which is a little more than two seconds. A bit over, yeah, somewhat over two seconds. Um, and then, did you review Tabby 4 tilde? Yeah, okay. So, Tabby 4 tilde is, is a Let's see, so it's doing an, a read into the array whose name is T1.27a, which is over here. And what goes in are the x values, that's to say where you want to be in the array, and it is in samples. And what comes out is just what value is in the array there, which is the vertical axis of this graph, if you like. Yeah. Is it possible to do like a, a transposition without the time stretch? Like, well, yeah, it's more work. But actually, you already sort of heard it because when I showed you in the previous patch how I was able to do little bits of samples in the table, you heard it going back and forth, backwards and forwards without transposing. But it was ugly, right? So to do that and make it pretty is actually hard. Um, we might get there in a couple of weeks, or we might not, depending on whether it turns out to be a good use of our time. Not sure. Yeah? Are there cases where you want to use Tabri tilde rather than Tabri before tilde, or is it just a better version? Yes. It, let's see, the best, the best example I know of is back in, in sequencer. Right.
So tab read four, on, on the other hand, that's what you want to, that's what you want to use if you want to clean the audio sound of reading a, a sample out. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, hip tilde? Hip tilde, yeah, high pass filter. Oh, okay. Let me show you, now that I'm in this context, one place where it's really good to have this. Um, one thing that you can do is run off the end of a table. So let's, let's go back to playing at uh, original transposition. Now I have a rather bad thing because if I disconnect this, oops, I don't have, I don't have badness yet. Oh yeah, you hear that click? I could make that worse. What if I do... Actually, what if I just say, like, what's the first sample on the table? Ooh, there it is. Yeah, it's not much worse. Okay. The reason that you hear that click is because tab read tilde is, is constantly giving me the last value on the table. So the line tilde is giving me 100,000 right now. I think. Let's, let's just verify this. Print tilde. And need a bang for this. So look at that. We have 100,000, 1 times 10 to the 5, coming out of the line. That's, that's appropriate because I asked it to go there in like 2268 milliseconds, right? Then we say tab read 4. And it says, okay, that's fine, and, I, and I'm going to give you 0 0.03, blah, 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 this amount. That's the value that's in the table, and it's, and it's a location that corresponds to 99,999, which is the last point of the table. Right? And that, when you disconnect it or connect it, sounds like a click, because it goes between that and 0. Or, right. Okay? So how do we get rid of this? We say hip tilde, 3. The 3 is just a good number, which is well under 20, which is the bottom limit of human hearing, roughly. And then we start, OK, so the print, print hip tilde here said these numbers. And then if I talk to hip tilde, I get these numbers, which are much, much smaller. They're down to truncation error. Right. Might even be limiting towards zero. You know, we'll go below that. So hip, so the high pass filter essentially cleaned up the DC value, the, the constant value of 0 0.03 that we had before. As a result of which, I can now disconnect it, connect it without hearing anything. So although I haven't told you about hip tilde, I systematically put a 3 hertz high pass filter in front of the digital to analog converter and before and after the analog to digital converter every time I make a patch that's going to deal with audio. If my patch is going to drive a DC motor, I don't do it, but that doesn't happen very often. So almost always I have a hip tilde 3 somewhere in the signal path. Yeah. I was going to ask what the 3 hertz wanted to be, but it's 3 hertz? It's 3 hertz. What that means is it's way below 20 hertz, so far below 20 hertz that by the time 20 hertz happens, the filter, we're so far away from the filter's roll off that it's not attenuating a signal. <coughs> values, engineers use values up to about 10 for that. Low, it's, it's a low cutoff. But if we can't hear it, then what's the point of it? Well, Point of it is that, or a point of it is, if I had a bunch of these voices and they were all stopped in the same way, but if their outputs all added up to something more than one, not only would I not hear anything, but even if I played a sound out in some other part of the patch, I wouldn't hear it. Because everything would be above the output maximum of the digital to analog converter. So, oh yeah, so here's a, here's a, here's a thing you might not want to do. Let's see, oh, it's a good review. Uh, let's do. 
when you get a toggle and they make a metronome. This, um, sorry about this. I'm going to make something that will annoy you. Out will come 60 twice a second. Like So we know what's coming out of this thing. <laughs> now what I'm going to do is show you how to make it hurt. So I'm going to do another one of these. I'm not going to even remember to connect anything to it, but I'm going to connect it with a bad volume. Now I'm going to start annoying you again. So I might have done this by accident, right? Somehow. But if, on the other hand, I had a high pass filter there. the bias is the speaker cone also going out towards its maximum travel? It should be, except that I have faith in the cheapness of the mixing hardware that we have here. Uh -huh. And it's almost certainly AC coupled, so that in fact there is an implied HIP somewhere in the hardware. Okay. Otherwise, I could actually literally push the speaker out of its cone. Well, okay, probably the amplifier wouldn't allow me to do that either, but uh, it would be bad because that DC fil uh, speaker's uh, resistance goes down, and so you could actually burn your speaker out if it would actually send that voltage to the speakers. Mm -hmm. But I have long experience with this brand of mixer because I'm cheap too, and I know that it won't actually do that to me. Neither will your home stereo. It's it's more expensive to build DC coupled stuff. Yeah. Um, is it possible to like create, write your own objects like the M2F, like, sure. like someone was saying before about uh, the samples to frequency, because that's just a simple mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, it's just an arithmetic expression. Yeah, you could just make an object that does it. And that was that is the subject or a subject, some of others, of Tom Herb's seminar that he gives in the fall on programming for the applications. Uh, Although, you can just sort of learn how to do it. Just um, go find a PD object that someone's written, see how, that, see how it's done by example, and just go from there. There are some thousands of them on the web. Other questions? Wow. OK, so. <coughs> So what happened was two things that were kind of jumbled together. One is this high-pass filtering notion, which is a good way of dealing with DC offset problems and signals, which will come in. This is, this is one good way of, of making yourself a DC offset without wanting to, have, having a sampler and just have it stuck in a location in the sample. But there are many others. In particular, if I, for instance, just say, give me an oscillator, that's, it now has a phase of zero because it starts at the top of the cycle. So it's putting out one constantly. 
and if I listen and if I put that out my DAC tilde, that will mess up the sound of the rest of the hash. Uh, frequency modulation and wave shaping. I've shown you frequency modulation, although I need to show it to you again more uh, controlledly. Uh, they have a tendency to have DC as part of their spectra. It's not the only thing they put out, but they will put out some DC as well as everything else. And as a result, if you are playing them, you probably want to put one of these things in the chain somewhere. Also. Okay, so that's this object. And then the other thing was this way of talking about transposition of, um, of samples. Done, as, done in a way that hopefully is as simple as possible, which is to say, first get yourself from pitch to frequency and then correct so that it's in the range that you want, which is 100,000 corresponds to no transposition. And the reason I decided that 60 should correspond to no transposition is just because that's kind of a habit. Middle C, might, by default, might mean no transposition on a sample. And 60 is the mini value from middle C. Questions about this? <coughs> Everyone's happy. All right, yeah. Is there a way to change the slope of the filter? Slope? Yeah. Well, OK. And this particular filter is the most simple-minded, well, second most simple-minded filter in the world. And the only thing you can change is the cutoff point. Um, it, uh, it always has a 3 dB per octave roll-off. So it's the cheapest, simplest possible low cut. <coughs> you, can, uh, you can get better ones, but then you land in a, in a region where there are actually thousands of designs of different filters. There are at least dozens of them available on the TV. And you would have to spend some time figuring out what, what characteristics you wanted. And I would just be able to give you a quick answer. Other questions about that? Okay, so what I want to do now is, um, well, first off, mention that, of course, this was playing the entire sample, but you can play bits of samples as well. And what I should do is start another window to show you playing a bit of a sample, because that will be interesting, because uh, it will make it much, much more important to be able to control the, the clicks that naturally happen at the beginnings and ends of samples. And so that should be kind of the next thing to worry about. So what I can do is do the save as, so we can hang on to this thing. And I thought it was going to be 4 not yet, but anyway. 4. Um, I won't get this far, but I'll start anyway. Uh, to do enveloping the sample. Okay. So the first thing that I want to do is say, OK, rather than make 100,000 points, I want to make 1,000 points, and I want to do it in, ugh, no, let's do 10,000 points, and let's do it in this amount of time, let's see how that sounds. Yeah, pretty good. Um, I should say here that this is not a good practice, I'm making a very short amount of time here, and time is quantized, uh, or rather I should say, line tilde has a quantization in its action, which is 64 samples. So this is not a terribly accurate way to make a sampler, because this will get quantized to about around one and a half, which would be noticeably out of 10 if we're actually being careful about it. So I'm making a, so this is just going to be a bad example for right now, because I want to show you the envelope. And then I can show you the so, problem with that is that, clicks every time you use it, and we would like it not to do that, right? So how do we deal with that? In the usual obvious way, you multiply by a line tilde. So, and the thing that you multiply is the output of the tab read for tilde. So what we really are going to want, and why did that happen? I thought I was high pass filtering that. Oh, I see. I am high pass filtering it, but I'm changing the value I put in the high pass filter, which gets to the step function, which we still hear, although then it thinks it. Any, anyway, let's get rid of this, and let's multiply it by 
between line tilde. Now we have two line tildes running around, and so there will be plenty of opportunity to get confused. The first one, let's see, this one here. This we don't need anymore. All right. This one now, what we're going to do is we're going to say, you are at zero, please, and then let's go up to a value of one and do it in a certain amount of time, which I think would be 50 milliseconds. And then, after a certain delay, I'm going to turn it back off. started it, but then 100 milliseconds later, we started sending it back down. But meanwhile, if I don't wait that whole 150 milliseconds before I send another message, it will bash the value of zero discontinuously, and that will sound like a click. So actually, it's a little harder than this. What you really should do uh, is... First thing you have to do is remember the value that you want, because we don't, we are not going to be able to use it immediately. So we're going to take the value and stick it in a nice F box, like this. That's step one. At the same time, oh, at the same time as that, we uh, will mute the value of the line tiller. So what that means is we will send it down to zero and do it very quickly. And now I will go ahead and do bad style and just send the floating point number straight into the message box. Okay. Then we will start a delay of five milliseconds. After which we do the rest of it using the floating point value like that. Okay, now I have to clean this up. that zero anymore because we just did that. Okay, so now what's happening? Oh you know what? Let me let me make it even a little bit better style and put it back in so that you can see it all in, in order. So first thing, first step is to mute the thing. So whatever is happening when I ask it to play a new voice, it doesn't do anything except just to mute the old one. 
because it might be playing something and, and, we, and the tune's going to start at zero. And if we don't then ramp it to zero, we're going to hear it click because it'll jump to zero. So we spend five milliseconds getting, you know, covering up for ourselves by muting whatever was happening previously. And then, oh, and by the way, next thing we do is take that floating point number and store it because five milliseconds later we're going to need it. And five milliseconds later, del is short for delay. Five milliseconds later, we will get the value out of the float, and then we will do the previous thing, which is bang this to turn the line on and do all this choreography for this line. Now, if we do that, we have. So this is now an almost complete and almost acceptable sampler in the sense that I can throw pitches at it and it will play samples back. And this is, yeah. Uh, in, the, in your trigger bang, float, bang, is the float doing anything? It's not... Yeah, this float corresponds to this outlet. Okay. And it is being remembered. So the float object, ah, right. I, I think this showed up last Tuesday. This is an object which remembers values, and then when you, when you give it a bang, which the delay will put out, it, it stores those values. There are other ways to cause a number to get delayed, but in general, when you want to do something after a certain amount of time and have the thing that you had before, you have to store it. So this is maybe conceptually the simplest way of doing it. Now the next thing you might want to do is, gee, we've got a sampler, let's make it 100 voice polyphonic. So let's just copy and paste this thing 100 times. Yeah. You want to do something different. So that's, that's coming. But actually, I think what's going to have to happen next time is more careful talk about envelopes and pitches and transpositions and stuff like that, because I'm sure there will be other misconceptions to clear up. So this is using line tilde and messages as opposed to using a phaser to loop through a sampler. I didn't even show you how to de-click samplers that are operated from phasers. There would be a totally different strategy for doing that. 